okay, never mind the fact that this movie has trolls, is called Troll, and frequently has people saying the word troll, but this movie features something in the opening credit sequence that should never ever be in any horror film of any fucking era. Oh yeah, I can feel the terror shivering down my spine. Oh wait, it's just the ghost of Sonny's mustache. Troll is one of those little creature features of the 1980s that seem to spawn more rapidly after the release of 1984's Gremlins. It's like they actually poured water on the movie Gremlins and fed it after midnight so it could spawn critters, ghoulies, munchies, twins, you name it. And the more these movies kept spawning, the less dark and more childlike they became. Such is the case with Troll. If Gremlins and Critters are Einstein and Edison, then movies like Troll and Hobgoblins are Lenny and Squiggy. Troll opens with the Potter family moving into an apartment building that's located... I really don't know where. Look at that. I recognize that view. It's the view from Alcatraz. There's no apartment building in the world that has that view, unless you're a mouse who's living in this model apartment building in front of that hotel room painting of the Golden Gate Bridge. One thing that can be said about this movie is that it really doesn't waste any fucking time. Five minutes in, and we have our turd with eyes. The troll sends the little girl off to, let's say, hell from the last scene of the beyond, and he ends up taking over her body to infiltrate the family. Once again, we're rushed into this five minutes into the movie. This is the plot right here. The Sonny Bono credits were just the setup. There's a downside to having your movie start up that quickly. With no build-up and all plot, it can make your movie feel a little slow. Like it's an entire movie built around what should only be the last 45 minutes. Granted, this movie is only 79 minutes long, and I'm grateful, but does it feel a little slow? At times, yeah, it's a little slow. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. Have I even properly introduced the main characters of this movie? Here, let me help you out. My, my name is Harry Potter. We just... I'm, I'm sorry. His name is what? Uh, <laughs> my name is Harry Potter. Nice to meet you, Porter. No, no Potter. Ah. Of course it is. Trolls, magic, mushrooms, and this Harry Potter here is a senior, which means... My name's Harry Potter Jr. I just moved into this building. That's right. Harry Potter Jr., 11 years before the books were written. Makes you wonder if J.K. saw this movie. Sometimes I wonder what I'm gonna do, no, that ain't... Please tell me this isn't what inspired Harry Potter. my god, please tell me J.K. Rowling didn't get her inspiration from this. This is what inspired Harry Potter. Fantastic. Harry Potter and the Troll Toll of the Boy's Soul. And what the hell is with all of this dancing in the movie? If you need someone to dance horribly in front of the camera, then fuck! Elaine Bennis lives right upstairs. Just ask her. But anyway, let's get back to Harry Potter. It, what, what the hell? Fucking Professor McGonagall is their fucking landlord? Actually, it's not Professor McGonagall. It's actress June Lockhart. And I know why she's in the movie. It's so I can do this. Starring June Lockhart... Hugh Riley, John Provost as Timmy, and of course, Lassie. We get to meet some more of the tenants in the movie, including Sonny Bono as some kind of 80s Glenn Quagmire. Only where Quagmire is successful in his Lotharioism, Sonny only has girls laugh at him. Not at the expense of Cher's jokes, but at the expense of him. Shit! 
Let's see, am I leaving out any of the other wacky neighbors? Owned and operated by liberal scum. They knock our president every chance they get. Leave us wide open for the communist menace, you know what I mean? Well, I oh yeah, Glenn Beck. How could I have forgotten about him? So the troll in the form of the little girl infiltrates each of these apartments in order to turn the tenants into a cocoon that sprouts plant life and more trolls. Is that what he wants to do? Or wait, he wants to create his own version of Eve out of Julia Louis-Dreyfus? He wants to kill off Nugent here? Nothing about what this fucking troll does makes any goddamn sense. In fact, since I get the idea that this troll has been held up in this apartment for so long, why is he waiting until now to take over a life form and spawn more trolls? Oh, I know why. It's because this movie wants to fucking annoy us with this loud-ass, overacting, annoying as truck nuts on a crying baby in a movie theater, little girl. Seriously, this girl is like if the bad seed were played by Shirley Temple. You remember that Aryan pancake youth from Cabin Fever? Well, as driveway dog shit annoying as that bastard was, he's got nothing on fucking rat food girl over here. Run! I've got a new game. It's called 79 Minutes to Kill Yourself. The only one who suspects her of being troll plowed is Harry Potter, who, as you can see here, is apparently a huge fan of Parasite 3D. Oh yeah, 14 year old boys in 1986 loved the lesser known schlock films of the brief early 80s 3D era. Maybe in the next room over there's a fucking poster for Space Hunter. It's sad when the rule of never reference a better movie in the middle of your crappy movie still applies when the movie you're referencing is Parasite 3D. Even though Harry is the first one to suspect his sister, it sure takes him a long fucking time to do so, and he gets this idea from watching a late night science fiction movie that I'm not sure actually exists. Acts like Spot, even smells like Spot. But in reality, it's a Martian. You mean? Yes. Our dog is a pod person from the planet Mars. But without Ginger Ron by his side, Harry's a little slower this time out. So he needs to see a similar movie a second time for the idea to really set in. It may moat like Tweety. It may even eat seed like Tweety. But it's an alien. You mean? Yes. <sighs> Your canary is a pod person from the planet Mars. Then, naturally, he tries explaining it in the most original way possible. She looks like my sister. She acts like my sister. She even sounds like my sister, but... But? She's an alien. Wait, since he saw the movie twice, that means he has to explain it twice. She may look like Wendy. She may act like Wendy. She may even dress like Wendy, but she, she's something else. The dialogue here is weird, too. It's like it has ADD and quickly gets distracted by plot points that aren't even part of the fucking movie. Everybody in the entire building is just disappearing, that's all, one by one. Well, it is the weekend. Do you know what day it was when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima? What? What the hell was that? Oh, jeez, someone's got to take care of this troll problem. My god, Pearl Harbor was a sad day. Also, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the guy playing the troll is taking on two parts in this movie. Hi, I'm Malcolm Mallory. Call it a hunch! Both characters are played by Phil Fondacaro, who is actually really good in this movie. He brings a lot of heart and sophistication to a movie that, well... He's a lot better here than a movie called Troll Deserves. Doctors have their big names for it. But if you ask me, this whole body's just worn out. You're gonna die? Looks that way. Oh, a cancer subplot. Naturally. As if people were coming out of the ghoulies go to college screening saying, that movie was pretty good, but it was missing one thing. 
leukemia. The climatic battle at the end comes down in the troll world, where Harry's sister sleeps well rested in a coma. Harry squares off against the troll, whose name is... Uh, hang on, let me check my notes. Uh, uh, Turok! Wait, Turok? Really? Turok? Is there any fucking name in this movie that I can't make fun of? I am Turok! And the trolls in this movie look less like trolls and more like what would happen if you put one of the troll toys in the microwave. But who cares, right? You didn't want me to see this movie. I didn't want to see this movie. You don't even want to see me review this movie. You want me to review something else, right? Something else troll-related? Maybe a sequel of some sort? Maybe a troll sequel that even has a documentary made about it? Oh yeah, Troll 2. Why'd it take me so long to figure out that title? Guess I'm about as slow as Harry Potter. So, you want me to review Troll 2, huh? Fine. How'd you know it was me? Oh, I recognize the knock. It's pre-pubescent. I have been to the Shibalba and back. I've seen a few bad movies, and Sean Connery's fucked a few women. Bad movies, they come and go. They walk up to your porch, hunch down, and take a shit right in front of your door. And it stinks. It smells like shit. Not something that just merely smells bad and you instinctively compare it to shit, but it literally smells like shit. But it's not going to be there forever. The rain will carry it away. The neighbor dog will smear it on a bagel. Or I'll just hire someone to clean it up. That's how I feel about some of these movies. They stink up my life for 90 minutes, and I have to fumigate my eye sockets, but I don't really think about them too much after that. As I've come to realize though, not every movie is Troll 2. The best thing that can be said about Troll 2 is that it's the perfect bad example. Pick something about the movie, anything you want. Not only does this movie do it bad, but it does it bad tragically. Almost like this movie is a father who intentionally spills his drink on the table as to show his son that that's what happens when you screw around. That is Troll 2. In the army of bad movies, it is a master. It is a father. It is a toxic wave of dinosaur shit that no matter how much I scrub my eyes, I am not going to be able to get the smell out. Not this time. From now on, every time I blink, I'm going to get a nut stuck in my cornea. First, we've got to talk about the trolls themselves. Goblins don't exist. Goblins don't exist. Goblins don't exist. Oh, I'm sorry. Sue me for actually thinking this movie would have trolls in it. Well, it doesn't. Just these things. Goblins. Not trolls, but goblins. It's hard to explain this detail about the movie without first getting into the history of the film. Troll 2 was an Italian production by Phil Mirage and shot in 1989 under the title Goblins. The film was directed by Claudio Fergasso, who some of you might remember as the director of Zombie 4 After Death. Can't remember. What did I think of that movie? This movie is such an unnecessary piece of garbage. It's so fucking bad that you will need a support group to visit after you get done watching this fucking thing. Huh. Guess it wasn't Kafka enough for my taste. 
In some markets, the film was actually released under the Goblin's title, but not here in the United States. I guess they figured, we've got a shitty movie about goblins, let's just attach it to a shitty 1986 movie about trolls. I'm going to be completely honest here. I think that this is one of the few times where this technique actually kind of works. Going into this movie, not knowing the backstory, not knowing that this wasn't intended to be a sequel to Troll, it still kind of feels like a legitimate sequel. It's not like Bruno Mattai's Terminator 2 or Jaws 5 Cruel Jaws where you just immediately call bullshit at the sight of the box cover, let alone the movie. The 1986 troll was a dumb, obnoxious valedictorian of the movie school for the special needs. Troll 2 feels like it could challenge that honor. A lot of the same elements are even here. If you squint your eyes, these look just like the descendants of Turok the Troll. Yeah, yeah, I know they're goblins, but think about it. Goblins, trolls, midgets, dwarves, elves, gnomes, Ewoks, Ruxpins. I guess I can pretend that Goblin is Italian for troll. Although with slightly less makeup skills. What the hell? Who designed these damn Troblins? Miss Mossman's third grade class? <laughs> really? Well, I'm sure she designed each and every one of them stark ass naked. Also, there's the element of plant life in this movie, too. The original had victims of the trolls turning into plant life, sometimes. And in this one, they become plant life, too. Sometimes. Other times, they just turn into key lime banana pie, apparently. My point is that there are all kinds of directors and distributors who have tried to fool us with sequelizations. Claudio Fergasso may be one of the first to actually succeed, because let's face it, the legend that this movie has attained, the devout followers it has spawned, it's an official sequel now. It's as official as The Godfather Part 2. How many Italian rip-off sequels do you know of that actually have the MGM logo in front of it? I guess I should probably talk more about the movie at this point. Really, do I have to? Can't I just say that a lot of people have seen this movie and leave it at that? Or can't I say that a lot of people before me have reviewed this thing? No? No, really? Well, okay, fine. Troll 2 is about the Waits family, who pack up their belongings as part of a temporary house exchange program, where two families, strangers to one another, switch houses. I once participated in something like that. When I came back home, they were inside filming an episode of Wife Swap. I immediately burnt my house down. The Waits family arrive in the town of Nilbog. Holy shit, it's Dracula spelled backwards! Right away, the boy Joshua Waits knows that there's something up. Why? Because his dead grandfather keeps appearing to him everywhere he goes. In the child's mirror to inside his room. By the way, I love the multiple baseball pennants in this room, all from competing teams. The original troll broke that unwritten rule of never mention a better movie in the middle of your crappy one. Does this one do that too? Ever dance with a goblin in the pale moonlight? Anyway, Grandpa tells the boy an ancient story of evil goblins who fool people into eating food that turns them into vegetables, which the goblins then in turn eat. He also keeps warning Joshua that if his family goes to Nilbog, then they are in danger of having the same thing happen to them. And could this ghost possibly look any more like Orson Welles if he tried? I'm sorry, if I want ghost Orson Welles, I'll stick with the critic. Yes, they're alive, but I have gone to a better place. A place filled with Mrs. Pell's fish sticks. Mm. Yes. Oh, yes. They're even better when you're dead. Mm. Immediately when the family goes to Nilbog, they're offered a free meal by the family who has just left. And no, I would never question the food these people would give me.
especially with it being fucking green. So Citizen Grandpa freezes the family so Josh has enough time to stop the family from eating. And there's only one thing anyone could possibly do in this situation. That's right, get them in the mood for sausage. Actually, he just pisses on their food. And you can't piss on hospitality. I won't allow it! Wow, I have a feeling someone pissed in his rice crinkles as a child. Whoa, whoa, what the hell? Is he gonna piss on him? Daddy? Tighten my belt by one loop so I don't feel hunger pains. And your sister and mother will have to do likewise. Okay, oh, he's tightening his belt. Because that's the logical place to take this scene. It's at this point when I ask myself, why does the grandpa keep appearing to the kid? No one is believing a word he's saying. Wouldn't it have made more sense to... I don't know, appear before the parents or someone who would immediately stop the trip to Nilbog from happening? There's a part in this movie where he accidentally appears before the sister. And once that happens, the parents almost start to take things a tad more seriously. See, a reason why you shouldn't rely on a 10 year old kid as your goblin's messenger. No one will fucking believe him! Oh, and there's a side story, too. The daughter, Holly, has a boyfriend, Elliot, who comes to her in the night before the trip. Elliot, what kind of idiotic joke is this? Uh, yeah. Anyway, he offers to go on the trip with her, but she won't allow it if he decides to bring along his friends, who seem to be holding pretty good balance there on that ladder. Oh, I'm sure he'll show up without his friends. How close could they be? Guys, didn't anyone remember to bring supplies? Ah! <laughs> okay, so they're Jesse and Grady close. The boys, along with their Martin Short sidekick here, are viet to Nilbog so Elliot can make up with Holly. But mainly so they can get killed off by Credence Lenore Gielgud. Oh, I'm sorry, who is Credence Lenore Gielgud, you ask? Other than a 1970s folk singer? I am Credence Leonor Gilgood of ancient Druid origins. Credence is the leader of the goblins who holds herself up in this church. This is my house. Oh yeah, and she's every drunk college girl at a Rocky Horror screening. Should I take the time to talk about some of the acting in the movie? Because it truly is the best acting that Porterville, Utah can find. Who are the goblins? The goblins? <laughs> truly. The acting here is equivalent to if your local town's insurance commercials suddenly broke out into a slasher film. Although this movie almost has an excuse. With a director and crew that did not speak a word of English, Claudio Fergasso thought it was a good idea to have every actor in the movie recite each line 100% like it was written in the script, which could possibly explain such line readings as this. They're eating her! And then they're going to eat me! Who could make that sound authentic, honestly? But it doesn't quite explain the line readings like this. Nilbog, a wonderful half-empty town. It's an exchange. A family from the country is coming to live here, and we're going to live in their house. Oh, Elliot, it will be wonderful. God, if she ever wins an Oscar, the statue will just be made out of hot dogs. And pretty much everyone else in the movie is like that, too. Coffee. There's no coffee here in Nilbog. It's the devil's drink. Eggs. Eh! So Claudio making them read the script verbatim is an excuse that kind of works and kind of doesn't. It's like saying that World War II was Mussolini's fault. He didn't start the war, but he didn't help things. Joshua does some investigating on his own and happens upon this goblin PETA meeting where they're preaching about the evils of eating meat. Even though it seems that the goblin's favorite hobby is eating human meat. Joshua ends up falling through the hole in the ceiling and being caught by the human goblins. 
Oh, don't worry. I know you're scared, but his skateboard is safe. Look, it pops up again later in the movie. Even after all of this, after this clan of post-Holocaust day after survivors try force-feeding the goo poison to Joshua, his family only finds it mildly weird. They don't take this opportunity to get the hell out of Nilbog. They just go back to that family's house. The family who they just fucking saw in the church with their son. Oh, but it's okay though, because the goblins throw the weights a party when they get back to the house. You know who else threw parties? Gacy! The weights don't start taking things seriously till their house is turned into Precinct 13 and surrounded by the goblins. Seance is performed to bring back Grandpa to either sell them some Palmasan wine or to help them figure a way out of this shit. Grandpa teleports Joshua out of the house to show him how to defeat the goblins. Oh, but he just leaves the rest of the family in there to die. No wonder none of them seem broken up that he's dead. Alright, oh, I almost forgot about her. What's the matter? Aren't you hungry? <laughs> Jesus, her overacting is so fucking fierce that I'm surprised you can't hear her in the background of scenes that she's not even in. It goes into some kind of weird species territory here, where she begins to seduce some of Elliot's friends in order to kill them. I know, how can this movie go into species territory when she's not an alien? Well, you know what? This movie goes into troll territory without any fucking trolls! Plus, I'm honestly not entirely sure if she wants to kill them or just fill them up with popcorn. I'm sorry, you can't have this much fucking popcorn in a movie unless your movie has both William Atherton and everybody wants to rule the world. With the power of a magic stone and a bologna sandwich, Joshua is able to defeat Credence and the Goblins. Credence and the Goblins. That's a concert that I would go see, but forget about that for a second. I don't care who's in danger. My friends, my family, whatever. I'm not fucking eating bologna! The family returns back to their hometown, goblin free. Or is it? You know what? These goblins seem to know a lot about this family, and throughout most of the movie have always been about one step ahead of them. If I happen to escape from these little Warwicks and make it home safely, the first thing I would do is throw away every single piece of food that I had. Why? Because if I don't, then this might happen. Funny how Grandpa failed to warn them of this. God damn you, Claudio Fergasso. It's always nice when you have a movie that's so awful that admittedly it's downright hilarious, and you just tack on a downbeat fuck you of an ending. Claudio Fergasso is good at doing that kind of thing. Claudio is credited as co-writer on a lot of the more popular Bruno Mattai films, and for some reason this guy just loves getting dark and dreary in the last two minutes of otherwise campy nonsense, like the eye buggery in Hell of the Living Dead, or the rat people in Rats. It's like he's making sure that even if you like his scripted movies, or in Troll 2's case, his directed movies, even if you like them, you're still leaving this theater unhappy. But don't listen to me, though. Go see the full-length documentary on the Troll 2 phenomenon called Best Worst Movie, directed by Joshua Waits himself. We get to meet all sorts of Troll 2 fans, catch up with the cast members, and find out where they've been since 1989. It reminds us that if history can remember serial killers and dictators, then surely it has enough room to remember a really, really, really bad movie called Troll 2. Oh my god! The 
1990 film Troll 2 has certainly seen not only an upsurgence over the past several years, but also keeps receiving more and more good news as time goes by. The highly acclaimed Troll 2 documentary Best Worst Movie has been picked up for distribution, and director Claudio Fragasso himself has even announced plans for a Troll 2 sequel titled What Else? Troll 2 Part 2. Who knows if this movie will actually happen, but one has to admit, that is a funny title. I mean, he can't very well call it Troll 3, can he? Because after all, there already is a Troll 3. Kinda. Sort of like how Troll 2 is a sequel to Troll. You know, kinda. It's pretty common to knock Troll 2 for not actually having trolls in it, but it did have goblins, the first cousin to the troll, so as far as illegitimate sequels go, it's close enough. But do you know what Troll 3 has in it? I'll tell you what it has. It isn't trolls, it isn't goblins, it isn't even fairies, elves, midgets, or gnomes. I'll give you one guess. Time's up. It's fucking trees! That's right, killer trees. This movie is about trolls as much as Zombie 5 was about zombies, or fucking birds. Though to be fair, the most common box art for the movie uses the title The Crawlers instead of Troll 3. Even my copy of the film doesn't even have Troll as its title, which, thinking about it, is appropriate. My copy of the movie is titled Creepers in its gooey green alternate title font that is different from the rest of the fonts in the credits. Other titles go by Contamination Point 7 and Troll 3. Go figure, this unofficial Troll sequel is co-directed by Fabrizio Laurenti. You know, the director of Evil Dead 4. But do you want to know the oddest thing about this movie? I kind of get why it's sometimes called Troll 3. Honestly, if I didn't know that was an alternate title, I still would have been thinking about Troll 2 throughout this entire movie. Both films are produced by the company Film Mirage, which was owned by exploitation king Joe D'Amato. This was also the company behind Zombie 6 and Ator the Invincible, and about every other movie D'Amato had his name attached to between 1980 and 1994. Both movies also have that weird aroma to them, where they look very American. They're clearly shot in the Pacific United States, with actors who probably live in the tiny-ass town they're filmed in, and they all speak English. Seriously, they try to make this movie look so American that I swear fucking Charlie Daniels gets killed at one point. But at the same time, with all of that said, it still feels like a foreign movie. And of course, like Troll 2, it has a completely Italian crew, who probably don't speak a word of English, and again, are making the amateur actors recite the script line by line. Some kind of measurement. Some G degrees. You don't know what that means? I know what it means. It measures nuclear radioactivity. You're damn right, kid. Just a guess. Also, Laura Gemser, star of the Black Emanuel series, is credited with costume design on this movie, too. Which is ironic, they have someone designing the costumes who made a career out of wearing absolutely nothing. When Troll 3 begins, we meet two young girls traveling by bus to the set of The Hills Have Eyes? Okay. At the same time, we're following a truck carrying yellow barrels of what I assume is nothing but bad news. In movies, nothing good travels in open barrels. Honestly, I think I know where this truck is going. Italy had a horrifying accident and fell into a vat of nuclear waste. And was it common in the 80s and early 90s to transport open barrels of liquid via truck? I know they sealed them in men at work, but that's just because they were carrying the brother's sheen. We get to meet some of the locals around this non-town while we wait for the killer plants to start growing. Well, his name is Chester, but I call him Wolfie. What? 
Then why isn't that his fucking name? A pet's name is supposed to be a fucking nickname. You don't say, oh, here's my cat Frank, but I like to call him Whiskers. The main character in the movie is Josie, who is in town to visit her family and give them awesome 1990 toys. Ooh, foreshadowing! He's gonna play Super Mario Brothers later. Still, that toy looks more like a real plant than this plant does. I think if they move any further to the left, they'll disturb Bruno Mattai filming Hell of the Living Dead. Josie also rekindles her relationship with a former flame. You look the same. You still got that tooth. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Just like I always say, when you want to score points with a girl, just remind her of her bad teeth. Hell, call her a bitch while you're at it. I can't believe you're still into that shit. Still as bitchy as you were at 16, right? See? You are on your way to getting laid big time, my friend. After fooling around in the woods while the trees watch, the two stumble upon the body of the girl from the beginning of the movie. Not that it matters, because there's a sheriff in the movie who is every annoying, skeptical, redneck movie sheriff combined into one fat piece of cardboard. We already told you everything, Sheriff. Yeah, look, why don't we just go there, okay? There's no hurry. If you really saw a corpse, it's not going anywhere. It won't run away. How do these fucking nitwit sheriffs keep getting elected? I'm afraid if someone told them that they won the election, they wouldn't believe them. Seriously, this sheriff actually says, ah, in this movie. We're not in high school anymore, sheriff. Maybe you ought to be. Ah. 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 I believe this guy is a sheriff about as much as I believe this is a real cell door. It's up to Josie and Lunk to find out the truth themselves. Did a girl come by here? Young, blonde hair, real short shorts? Oh yeah, I can see why he remembered her. You know, with her flowing blonde hair. As it turns out, an evil company is responsible for dumping hordes of toxic chemicals into the woods, causing the trees to grow killer roots that strangle people to death. At first, we really just see moving point of view shots from the roots, which makes perfect sense when in the next shot, the roots aren't moving. The man in charge of the dump is an actor, and I use the term lightly, I'm sure was just the movie's accountant that they put in front of the camera at the last minute. This guy looks like Elisha Cook crossed with Joe Lieberman, and he's about as emotional as an actor as five bucks could buy. He's an investigative reporter for some big city newspaper. Oh, Christ. Good Lord. If this guy had any more personality, he'd only look mildly bored. Now, I'm sorry, be... Dr. Taylor, but I have other things to do now. I would appreciate if in the future you would limit your concerns to what's going on inside the power plant instead of snooping around. Is that understood? Yes, sir, but I... You may go now. And when he does try to show some range, it just comes across as scary. Like when he attempts the most awkward, evil laugh I've ever seen on film. You want me to cooperate? <laughs> Ha 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 drop dead. Um thanks. The movie really starts to feel Italian when Gabriel Tinti turns up on screen. And it's one of the only times I've seen him not dubbed in a movie, and I think I know why. But her body is soaked with radioactivity, as if she swam in, in a pool of uh, uranium. He seems to not know a word of English. What, the local barber was too busy to take a role in the film? 
The town gets a little help from the woodsman in black here, and a nerdy guy who makes Peter Scolari look like Brian Bosworth, but mainly we're following around the plant drunk who just gets thrown in jail because, of course, he reported a crime and the fucking sheriff didn't believe him! Take a seat, Dr. Taylor. You've been working too hard. Why would anyone even attempt to report anything to this sheriff? This sheriff seems to be the reason why vigilante justice was invented. This fucking guy was only created so he could die a horrible, horrible death. <laughs> Halfway through the movie, I wish they would just get help from the camera crew. I mean, look, they're right there in the fucking reflection. Ah, uh, sure, go ahead and close the door, in case we didn't get a good look at them the first time around. And look at this, you can see the shadow of the helicopter. Oh, oh, the characters are actually in the helicopter. Sorry, I get a little ahead of myself on the trashing sometimes. The drunk breaks out of prison by torturing Coily. No springs indeed, my friend. Lucky for him, he gets out of prison just in time to witness every other person in the movie get killed off by the killer trees. And even characters who we've never seen before. Everyone in this fucking movie gets tree hugged. Oh man, these people need to be arrested for some serious treason. I'm sorry for that one. It's weird watching these limbs move. They look like turds being slowly squeezed out of the Earth's asshole. And the way they strangle people, they just seem like snakes. That's really all these trees do. They mostly strangle people. Again, and again, and again. Or they plug up a tailpipe like they're Axel Foley. If you squint your eyes, this is just a killer snake movie, only they're all made of wood. If they really wanted to make an illegitimate sequel, really the most appropriate title is sequel The climax comes when bulldozers surround the trees, completely taking out all the local plant life, while the crowd cheers them on. Wait a minute. This ending is like a reverse avatar. Fuck you, tree of life. I don't care about your unobtainium. I just want to destroy your fucking trees, that's right. And seeing how the dialogue went so swimmingly throughout the rest of the film, when everything is all safe and settled, it just has to end with an awkward conversation. I didn't know you were married. Yeah. What? Is that so funny? <laughs> Not at all. What the hell was that? Yeah. We know you saved us and everything, but come on, fucking nerd, we know you're a virgin. Seriously, is there an alternate version of the script where they just call his mother a whore? Well, I've already extended my look back at the Troll series as long as I could possibly go. I've searched and searched and searched and have never found a Troll 4. So as far as the Troll movies go, I am completely done here. And I don't think I'm jinxing myself at all. Not in the least. So if you ever come across a Troll, a Goblin, or a Plant, be on the lookout because that could possibly mean that Film Mirage is back in business. Good night, everyone. Dear Cinema Snob, I regret to inform you there is another movie under the Troll 3 title called Quest for the Mighty Sword. Ha ha ha. Sincerely, J. Matthews at Mondo.com. God damn it! <laughs> Ain't I a stinker? The fuck are you talking to? Oh, no one. Damn, nosy jerk. We've now come to the fourth and final review in my look back at the entire troll series. A group of movies that revolve around. Trolls. We've seen trolls, goblins, and trolls.
trees in three different films that were never intended to be interlinked with each other. So isn't it appropriate that I'm now reviewing the fourth installment that actually is a fourth installment, but to another completely different film series? Let's go back a little bit to the year 1982, when Conan the Barbarian pillaged through the box office. Joe D'Amato, a blacklisted European writer, figured, hey, I'm sure there's deserts around here somewhere. I'm sure we got some rock-hard, bare-chested men here in Italy. Why not make our own Conan-style series of films? and make those movies he did, starting, of course, in the year of Conan, 1982, with Ator the Invincible, starring Miles O'Keefe. That film proved to be such a success in Europe that a second Ator film was set in motion. Of course, even if the first wasn't a success, 1984 was the year of Conan the Destroyer, so naturally, that meant there had to be an Ator sequel. Regardless. At first, the sequel was widely known here in the States as the Blade Master. That is until 1991, when it became better known under another title. Cave Dwellers, wasn't he in... Uh, uh, cave, cave Dwellers, um, no, it's the yeah. name of the movie. A Demodolus third installment called Iron Warrior was released, with Joe D'Amato completely disregarding its existence. Think about that for a minute. Joe D'Amato one of the kings of the European cash-in genre, the man who brought us Caligula, the untold story, and his own line of Emmanuel films, trashed this movie for being a cash-in. That's sort of like Bruno Mattai disregarding the existence of Dawn of the Dead. And I think a nucleus just exploded in my brain. So D'Amato returned in 1990 to bring us Ator 4, a.k.a. Ator 3, asshole. But it's most commonly known as Quest for the Mighty Sword. This is the only Ator film not to feature Miles O'Keefe in the chestular role, which could possibly mean he was still riding high on that inglorious bastard's 2 money. Instead, Eric Allen Kramer was given the Ator role based on his performance two years prior in the TV movie The Incredible Hulk Returns, in which Kramer played Thor. I'd like to think that D'Amato never actually saw that movie. He only gave Kramer the role because Thor sounds a little bit like Ator. That would make the most sense, because look at this guy. He looks about as much like Miles O'Keefe as Jude Law looks like Brian Dennehy. What the hell, is he balding on top? Is that a double chin? Ettor's put on a little weight this time, too. Either that or his breastplate is just held up with bags of pudding. Maybe they just built a Denny's right next to the castle, and Ator likes to chase his western burger with whatever he bought from the Chili's, which they've also built. What the hell, he can't even bend down to pick up this weapon? He just used his sword the same way an old lady would have used it to pick up her keys. This guy's turn as Ator makes about as much sense as doing a Point Break 2 and replacing Patrick Swayze with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Wait, hang on. What, what the hell just happened? Sorry, I was too busy being a smartass to pay attention to the movie. Did, did Ator just die? That is Ator, right? He accepts Prince Ator's sentence. Okay, Prince Ator? Don't remember him being royalty in the previous films, but maybe that's what they did with the missing Prince Adam plot in Masters of the Universe. They just inserted it here. So Ator dies, and he leaves his sword of power to his son, also named Ator, and the boy and the Ator widow flee the castle before they're killed. What's going on here? Is this a fucking prequel? Or is older Ator here supposed to be the aged Ator from the previous films? Joe D'Amato has the fucking storytelling abilities of a narcoleptic. Before I go any further, we need to discuss where Troll 3 comes from. The German translation of the film's title comes out to Troll 3, The Sword of Power. 
It isn't that uncommon for rare markets to take other foreign movies and attach their own alternate titles to them to make it sound like they're a sequel to something completely unrelated. But whenever this happens, it isn't like those alternate titles are commonly known. And if they are, they're quickly forgotten, like 1975's The Possessor, a.k.a. Exorcist 3. But in the case of this Troll 3 alternate title, you can actually see a trailer of it with the Troll label. The first three Troll movies had the linking plot device of plants throughout them, either with plants being used as pods or as fucking killers. This movie, it doesn't have the plants, but it has a little something else to link the stories. The same fucking mask from Troll 2. That's right. It's got a fucking goblin mask in it. So naturally, the fact that the movie's got a goblin makes it a sequel to Troll? On the IMDb page, it even says that this movie follows all of the Ator movies and all of the Troll movies. How confusing is that for someone just going into this page blindly? Why don't you just say that Spider-Man 3 follows Daredevil, Fantastic Four, Hulk, and Citizen Toxie? You know, because they all have Stan Lee in them. It makes me wonder how, of all the masks in Troll 2, they settled on this one. Did D'Amato just pick it at random, or did he say, I specifically want the one that looks like Red Fox? In this movie, the goblin's name is Grendel, and guess what? They have him talk! Bitch, bitch, wake up, bitch! Okay, you got me. That's not his real voice. That is why we have no children. No, you wouldn't have cried out if I had been a handsome blonde prince. <laughs> that is fucking horrifying looking. This thing's mouth moves with the ease of watching someone with their lips melted off, saying only B words. Ator Jr. and his mother meet up with Grendel when they're hiding out, and Grendel agrees to raise the boy, but only if Ator's mother puts out for him. I really don't like where this is going. You gotta pay the troll toll. If you wanna get into that boy's hole, you gotta pay the troll toll to get in. You want the baby boy's hole, you gotta pay the troll toll. You gotta pay the troll toll to get in. Ator's mom agrees to sleep with Grendel so he can raise Ator. I'm starting to think that Ator's mother is the kind who makes poor decisions. Just because you had a nice husband does not mean that every person who wants to fuck you should be raising your kids. Ew, ew, thanks movie. I always wanted to see Bernadette Peters make out with a squash. What? Who is this now? Oh, okay, it's New Ator. I guess we're years into the future then. This movie is absolutely terrible at making any kind of time cut. They could have faded to white and then jumped ahead years, or they could have put up some title card in there, or hell, here's what I really would have preferred. Ator is raised by Grendel, and go figure, Grendel turns out to be a raving sadist who hides the broken pieces of Prince Ator's sword to keep the new fat Ator from destroying him. But that doesn't mean Grendel can't tease Ator a bit with some fake swords. <laughs> this movie feels as medieval as a Bert and Ernie sketch. Eighteen. Okay. This guy's about as eighteen as George Burns. No wonder this guy tries sounding like an eighteen-year-old throughout the movie. Not even the sword is enough to defeat the king of the gods. I understand that now. I like how it seems like the only person who knows how silly this movie is, is the guy doing the music. Because whenever the goblin comes on screen, the soundtrack gets really zany. And 
and sometimes the music will sound all fantasy epic, like it should, but once that goblin comes on screen, it immediately changes over! God, if they wanted a haunting monster theme, why don't they just put in some stock music? Also, it should be known that this goblin comes across so ridiculous that at one point, I get the feeling that even a crow starts laughing at him. <laughs> Ator's mission in the movie is to gain the sword of power, to avenge his father's death, and to free this female warrior who was captured and put under a spell earlier in the movie. I don't know how to describe this actress's performance, other than I get the vibe that she starts speaking her lines just as her heroin dose begins to kick in. Do not kill Ator Thorn! He has shown wisdom in all his doings. Ator finds the pieces to his father's sword and destroys this fucking Troll 2 mask before it can do any more harm to any other movies in the future. Here's your toll, Troll. Now it's up to Ator to roam the lands on his quest for the mighty sword. Even though he has that sword now, making that quest over with. So now he's on a quest for... barbecue? Ator meets up with some new friends at a local cantina, where Ator sits and watches a prostitute get smacked around for about 60 seconds before ultimately intervening. I can only assume he was waiting for his cheese fries to pass. The rest of the movie is padded out with whatever monsters they can think of off the top of their heads to throw at Ator and his crew. Oh yeah, speaking of heads, they get attacked by a two-headed robot! Aw, oh, come on, you've got a scene with a two-headed robot. Did you really have to make the scene any more slapsticky by having them get stuck in a door? This is more like the two-headed monster from Sesame Street! Oh, <laughs> At one point in the movie, I'm pretty sure Godzilla turns up to breathe fire on our heroes. This is a little weird, seeing how I've never seen a Godzilla costume in its exact size before. It feels more like I'm watching Ator battle a Gorn. If only he knew how to make his own gunpowder, this scene might get over with quicker. There is so much filler in this movie that the villain named Gunther doesn't even turn up till about an hour into the movie. Ugh. I think that if they ever made a sequel to that Super Mario Brothers movie, this is what Wart would have looked like. And even after Gunther shows up, they add even more filler by having him repeat his lines via poor editing. <laughs> Take it away! Take it away! Good work, Joe. Now your movie is two seconds longer. And it's already 90 fucking minutes! Oh, and as you can see here, just in case they didn't get enough usage out of their Troll 2 masks from earlier, another fucking goblin shows up as the henchman to Gunther! If you'll permit me, Your Majesty, I suggest you prepare yourself properly for the encounter. As you know, the first impression is the one that counts. Yeah, that's what I always assumed the Troll 2 Goblin sounded like. Thomas Hayden Church? Ator finally meets back up with his mother, who goes from being young to being old while in his arms. He burns her body, and I get the feeling that it isn't because she's dead, and that's just tradition. I think he's punishing her for leaving him with that fucking Goblin! Either way, I get the sense he's about to go off and slaughter some Jawas. One thing that I notice about this movie is how little swordplay there is in it. Every time Ator swings his sword, it's always in the same motion, as if that's the only direction he got. Swing the sword around a couple of times, and if it hits something, then perfect! Or maybe the sword is just way too fucking heavy for its actors to use as a weapon. 
That could be why we have this scene of Ator and his lackey just watching other people swing their swords for two minutes. This isn't filler. This is just Ator picking up tips on how to use his weapon. Doesn't matter anyway because they suddenly give Ator the power of drawing an entirely new weapon out of thin air. Then why the hell didn't he just... You know what? Never mind. That isn't the most unrealistic thing I've seen Ator do in these movies. Oh, come on! <laughs> Terrific. I think the biggest disappointment about this movie is that it has its original opening credit sequence. When I think of Ator, I think back to that ridiculous Film Ventures video release of Cave Dwellers that used stock footage from another movie as it put in its own credits and alternate title. But the best thing about the Film Ventures credits, though, is that they're so cheap that even if the movie you're watching doesn't have them, it'll only take you about five minutes to make your own. Hell, just throw in your own alternate title while you're at it. Wouldn't you figure that with this being the last film to carry both the Troll and Ator titles, that it has a fucking open ending? Given that both Phil Mirage and Joe D'Amato are not part of this world anymore, I don't think that any kind of Troll 3 slash Ator 3 slash 4 Quest for the Mighty Sword of Power follow-up is ever going to happen anytime soon. Although, we still do have Claudio Fergasso!